This is a mechanism of disease map for acute tonsillopharyngitis. This flowchart includes group A strep infections, as well as some of the complications of group A strep infections. As in all of these flowcharts, each of these boxes is color-coded according to this legend in the top right, and I'll be going through the etiologies, the manifestations, and the pathophysiology of acute tonsillopharyngitis. Let's clear out all the, slide, all the boxes and get started. So at the central pathology of acute tonsillopharyngitis, you have, by definition, infection of the tonsils and or the pharynx, which is the throat, by viruses or by bacteria. Now, viruses are more common in both adults and children, but when you compare the two, adults and children, kids tend to have bacterial throat infections more. The rates of bacterial infections in the throat for kids is up to 30%, whereas in adults it's around 10%, um, whereas the remaining 70% and 90% in children and adults respectively are from viral infections. So viruses kind of dominate the space, but a lot of what we learn is from the bacteria, and one bacteria in particular, group A strep, as we'll see. Let's just lay out all of the etiologies, um, the well-known viruses and bacteria that cause this, just to be complete. Many of the viruses include adenovirus, rhinovirus, coronavirus are the most common ones, a bunch of the herpes viruses like herpes simplex, that's HHV1 and 2, Epstein-Barr virus, that's HHV3, and cytomegalovirus, that's HHV5, influenza virus and para-influenza virus can also cause a sore throat, and the acute phase of HIV can do this as well. These are the most common bacterial etiologies of acute tonsillopharyngitis. The most common is at the bottom here in bold. It's Streptococcus pyogenes, also called Group A Streptococcus. I'm sometimes abbreviating it as GAS here. Other common bacteria include staph species, H. influenza, Neisseria gonorrhea, C. diphtheriae, Mycoplasma pneumonia, and some Fusobacterium species. But really, by far the most common of the bacteria are group A strep. And again, just to clarify, most of the time you have an acute tonsillopharyngitis, it's a viral picture for both adults and children. Now these viruses and bacteria can transmit through the air, they can be airborne, they can also be transmitted through droplets and through saliva. So there's a lot of ways to transmit um, and start one of these infections. Now it's important to differentiate between the viruses and the bacteria because their presentations are slightly different. And let's see if we can differentiate between these. The typical signs and symptoms for a viral acute tonsillopharyngitis include cough, rhinorrhea or runny nose, oral ulcers and anterior stomatitis, which are just ulcers in the mouth area, coryza, which is really just rhinitis, inflammation of the nasal passageways, conjunctivitis, so you, it can kind of affect the eye, give you a pink eye appearance, and some other standard viral things throughout the body, maybe body pains, maybe joint aches, including diarrhea. Usually from the viral infection, you do not have a fever. Now let's contrast these typical viral symptoms from the typical bacterial presentation. First, the bacterial presentation is usually faster um, to start up, to get worse. Sometimes it's sudden onset symptoms. In the bacterial infection, you're more likely to have a fever. You're more likely to have a sore throat. You can even have dysphagia, difficulty swallowing, um, tonsillopharyngeal inflammation. So when you go to the doctor, they look in your throat, they're more likely to see erythema and edema, that redness in the throat. You can even have exudates in the throat, tonsillopharyngeal exudates, that's like white plaque-like exudates that kind of come out of your tonsils or come out of the back of your throat. Palatal petechiae, uh, these are like red dots that would be in the top of your mouth. So tonsillopharyngeal exudates are usually white spots, Palatal PKA has red dots. Cervical lymphadenitis, so you can feel some lymph nodes that might be swollen, tender, and usually there's no cough. So the big differentiating features between the viral symptoms and the bacterial symptoms are that the bacterial comes on faster, bacterial has fever, viral has cough. Um, there might be some overlap between the two, but those are generally some rules. And if you actually look at the centaur criteria to help you differentiate strep throat, a lot of those are the differentiating features. The no cough, the fever, the sore throat, uh, stuff like that. The exudates is one of them as well. These are some red flag symptoms for a worsening infection. Now there are many complications of group A strep throat and I've listed some of the more common and some of the more severe ones here. These uh, complications are kind of ambiguous to any of the 
bacteria that can cause a strep throat, and afterwards we'll talk about some of the co some of the complications that are more specific to group A strep. But these are kind of the bacteria agnostic complications of acute pharyngitis. You can have a peritonsillar abscess that usually presents as trismus, change in voice, and a unilateral sore throat, which would be pretty unusual. That's when you have an abscess on one side. You can have a parapharyngeal abscess that also presents as trismus. This one's a little concerning because it can restrict the airway, so the patient might present with shortness of breath or dyspnea, strider, and neck induration. You can have a cervical lymphadenitis. This is, again, those swollen, tender, enlarged lymph nodes in the neck. The bacterial infection can spread to the mastoid bone, so the patient might have a tender, swollen mastoid in mastoiditis, and the ear sometimes protrudes forward in an anterior lateral displaced ear. Otitis media is when the bacterial infection spreads to the middle ear cavity. Patient might have decrease in hearing, hearing loss, ear pain, ear ache, also called otalgia, and on your ear exam you'll notice a bulging tympanic membrane without a, a light reflex. It's also possible that the tympanic membrane is retracted, but either way, the tympanic membrane will be displaced and you will not see your light reflex when doing ear exam. Of course, the nasal passages are all very close to the throat and the tonsils, so you can also have a sinusitis, a bacterial sinusitis, where you'll have kind of this exudate coming from the, from the nasal passages. You can have post-nasal drip, and they can even feel like a headache, facial pain, and pressure um, kind of all in the front of their face from their sinuses being filled up with bacteria. Next, we're going to talk about three more complications that are all associated with group A strep in particular. First one is scarlet fever. This one happens when group A strep produces an erythrogenic exotoxin. Um, exotoxin A is the most common, but B and C are some others. And this causes a delayed type skin reaction. And it usually happens a few days after the uh, throat infection, after the tonsillopharyngitis. Group A strep can, in this case, cause a sandpaper-like rash. This rash in particular blanches with pressure, and you can also have a strawberry tongue, and those two symptoms are characteristic of scarlet fever. And of course, you can always have these other symptoms as well, so you'll have these symptoms in addition to your standard group A strep um, bacterial infections. Next group A strep complication that's worth knowing is post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. In this case, the strep antigen forms immune complexes, and those complexes deposit in the glomerular basement membrane. This is type 3 hypersensitivity, and it causes glomerulonephritis and nephritic syndrome. So you'll have the symptoms of nephritic syndrome. You'll have hematuria, which you might notice on a urinalysis, or you might grossly have tea or cola-colored urine. You'll have hypertension, and it can get so bad that it causes headaches. You can have edema throughout the body, most prominently in the, in the face, sometimes around the eyes. And in really bad cases, if the patient has some other causes of edema, it can cause dyspnea if you end up with pulmonary edema. And you can have general inflammatory malaise symptoms, including fever and flank pain. This post-strep glomerulonephritis usually happens a few weeks after the group A strep throat infection. So it's usually the patient will get better, their sore throat will go away, and then a couple weeks later, they'll have these kidney symptoms. And that'll be a post-strep glomerulonephritis. Last one that's worth knowing is rheumatic fever. In this case, the body is developing antibodies against group A streps M protein, as the body should. Um, the problem here is that you have molecular mimicry. You have a cross-reaction of the antibodies that your body produced with other proteins in your own body. So the patient's antibodies are actually attacking the patient's own cells, and it's a type 2 hypersensitivity. Now these other proteins are in various tissues throughout the body, most notably in the heart and in the neural tissue. So we'll see some heart symptoms and we'll see some CNS symptoms. Myosins, for instance, are the proteins that are affected in the heart. And in the heart in particular, you end up with valvular lesions, so you can have all kinds of new um, valvular problems, which usually manifest as heart murmur, sometimes shortness of breath as well. So you can see that on an echo, you might see that on physical exam. In the heart, you can also have pancarditis. This means that all three layers of the heart muscle are affected. So endocarditis, myocarditis, pericarditis. Pericarditis in particular presents as a pleuritic chest pain, worse with breathing, and a friction rub on your exam. In the joints, this can manifest as a migratory polyarthritis, and it usually affects the large joints like your knees and elbows and hips.
In the central nervous system, you have both motor symptoms and psychiatric disturbances. Sindenhem chorea is the name for the motor symptoms that are characteristic of rheumatic fever, and the psychiatric disturbances can vary pretty broadly. It could be memory deficits, it could be um, getting really hungry, becoming very rude, it could be change in personality, all kinds of changes um, from rheumatic fever. Lastly, the skin symptoms are worth knowing. There are subcutaneous nodules and erythema marginatum that are both associated with rheumatic fever. So this has been a brief flowchart of acute tonsillopharyngitis, including some group A strep complications. I hope this was helpful, mainly in differentiating the viral from the bacterial symptoms, knowing these red flag symptoms that might present when the bacteria infection is spreading, and knowing some of the complications that are specific to group A strep. Thank you for listening.